Hello and welcome to another episode of Life of a Singer with Mitchella Jigbe. My guest for today is a lovely woman who, after her senior high education in Holy Child Senior High School, relocated to the United States of America with the intention of studying for a law degree. As life would have it, she rather studied and graduated with a degree in music and theater arts from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, after which she moved to the New England Conservatory of Music, where she had a master's degree as well. She, however, returned to Ghana in 2009 and has since worked as a presenter, broadcast journalist, event host, producer, and an entrepreneur. Indeed, she wears so many hats as she is a wife and mother to four beautiful children. My guest for today has performed for many notable personalities, which definitely include the President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency Nanado Dankwa Ekufuadu. She had the honor of working with the legendary South African trumpeter Hugh Masekela on his Christmas album that featured popular Christmas songs. Known for her contribution to the classical and choral industry in Ghana, as well as the radio and television industry as well, my guest for today is the amazing Kokui Selume Hansen. Thank you so much, Kokui, for coming on the show. You're welcome, Michelle. Thank you for having me. That's Thank great. You. So you're on the lips of so many Ghanaians for having a voice that is not necessarily <laughs> Ghanaian. Your voice is said to be very operatic and very classical, right? And then we gather that you have been classically trained. You were trained in the U.S. So the first thing I want to know is why you decided to come back to Ghana <laughs> after being trained. You know, you could have stayed there. Why, why did you decide to come back to Ghana? Well, Ghana is home, isn't it? It, it I mean, is. This, this is home. And I think, and this is just my personal opinion, yeah. you know, I think we all need to, to do our part to contribute to Ghana. And yeah, yeah, someone might say you can do that, but not have to be in Ghana, which is true. true. There are a lot of Ghanaians living in the diaspora who are doing amazing things and putting Ghana on the map. Yeah. But I, I wanted to come home. And, you know, I let me compare it to this. So I do something that isn't necessarily mainstream here. Yeah. It isn't necessarily common. Yeah. But it's a skill. It's mm -hmm. a talent. Mm -hmm. My voice is very much Ghanaian. It's just that I sing a certain <laughs> style of music, right. you know. Um, what if Teta Kwashi had decided that the cocoa from Fernando Po would not come here? Yeah. Then we wouldn't be this huge chocolate producing <laughs> or cocoa producing country that we yeah. are. So, you know, I think it's okay to garner skills from abroad, bring them back home and see how those skills can be utilized. So I decided to come home and try my luck. <laughs> yeah, and you have done so well, but how lucrative is it here in Ghana? You know, the thing about it is, obviously, classical music opera here is not as popular, I'll, I'll, I use that lightly, as it is in other areas, right? Yeah. But there is an appreciation for it. Yeah. And, you know, you might call it a niche genre here, but there are lots of people who appreciate classical music because at the end of the day, it's still music, isn't it? Exactly. And beautiful music is beautiful music, no matter what the genre of is. Course. And I think anyone can appreciate beautiful music, good music, even if they don't understand it. Exactly. So even if you're singing in another language, whether it's Italian, German, French, there's something about the music that might touch somebody. Yeah. Maybe they don't even realize what it is, but it speaks to them. Yeah. It's like maybe you go to a museum or an art gallery and you see a painting or you see a piece of art. It might be abstract. You might not even understand it. But when you see it, it yeah. evokes some kind of response from you and you, you appreciate it in a way. Yeah. I think it's that kind of thing. that it's Classical music can appeal to anyone. And indeed, you know, in countries where it originated... It, it, it's not supposed to be something just for the elite or it's an elitist art form. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be something that anyone and everybody can enjoy. Exactly. And I truly think that people from all walks of life can enjoy and appreciate classical music. Yeah, you're right. But why is it that so many of the youth today, as opposed to the older generation, I, I mean, the younger generation don't necessarily appreciate or have that love for the music as much as the older generation. What can we do then to make sure that these people come to love the music? I like that you said once it's good music and if it's done right, then people should appreciate it. But what, what further step can we take to ensure that more of the youth or the coming generation love classical mm -hmm. music as much as we do? 
I think, um, are we speaking about specifically youth in Ghana? Or yeah. Specifically, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I actually think there are a lot of young people who do like classical music, but sure. it's just that, again, it's not as popular here as other places, yeah. but when they do hear it, they do like it. And, you know, sometimes people conflate classical music and choral music and okay. there's a you know there's a distinction yeah. um that choral music isn't necessarily classical yeah. or opera let's put yeah. it that way but there's a lot of young people who do appreciate the genre i just think you know mainstream music obviously on the you turn on the radio you're going to hear hip life you're going to hear these days asaka <laughs> you're going to hear you know drill music yeah. you you might you might hear some classic high life as well yeah. you know but that the classical genre again is it's so specialized and so niche that you won't hear it played all the time yeah but on the rare occasions that you do hear it you'll find lots of people saying oh oh that was nice because yeah. it's a break from the norm of course. and sometimes it's nice to have a break from bush, bush, music. <laughs> <laughs> like yes. that way. you know something that's yeah. calming and and soothing and and exciting as well yeah, you know yeah. classical music has a lot of depth to it and, and opera has a lot of interesting stories behind it i used to host a, a show on city fm called classic city in fact yeah. that was the first radio show i did in mm -hmm. ghana when i mm -hmm. yeah when i came home and that was what the show was about it was about me playing classical music and then explaining to listeners what the piece was about yeah. so if it was an operatic piece i would explain the storyline behind the opera yep. and maybe if it's an aria from an opera i'll say okay this character is singing this song at this point right. in the opera because yeah. if it was an orchestral piece i would say okay it's composed by you know, mozart symphony this blah, you know so just to give people an understanding so when you're listening to the music then you're like oh okay so that's why yep. well, this is what this means and mm -hmm. i think that also helps when people understand what they're listening to maybe they appreciate it a bit more so yeah maybe a bit more education about the genre is also important. Yeah, and probably a, a lot more shows. Shows as well. You know, shows I think as that well. perhaps if, if it's played often and played properly, sang properly, done properly, a lot more people will appreciate it. Maybe, yes, maybe right. so. And, and I think that's for any genre. You know, we've come a long way. Yes. Even in music that people might say is Ghanaian, with yes. the way shows are produced, even music videos yes. have come a long way now. And yes. that's more attractive to people. So yes. now they turn on the TV, oh, they want to see the latest video by so-and-so because it's so well done. Yeah. So yes, if we have more classical music that is produced in a, a, a you know top quality productions, perhaps people will be intrigued and want to learn more. And maybe we'll get to the point where we can write our own operas. What is an opera anyway? Exactly. You know, it's lyrics set to music, right. really. And it tells stories. Yes. And we've got a lot of stories to tell. Yeah. So why could, why can't we have our own Ghanaian operas as well? True. The, yeah. the composers need to mm -hmm. make stuff for us to sing. <laughs> and you know, that would yeah. be just amazing. But now if we should take on a career in opera or in yes. classical music here in Ghana, can a musician thrive on classical music here in Ghana? I think it depends on how far you want to take it. Mm -hmm. Um and if you're able to get the right combination of forces together, so, you know, production team opportunities to perform. Okay. Um, for me, it, it has been very, very seasonal or occasional. Okay. You know, you, you at certain times of the year, you might get more calls True. for gigs. Obviously, now with COVID, a lot of that has slowed down. <laughs> I'm going um, to ask you that next. <laughs> you know, um, so the certain seasons, you'll realize you get more calls. Weddings, you get a yes. lot. Funerals. Exactly. A lot of people call for that as well. So it, it can be as lucrative as the opportunities are. Yes. I'll say it that way. And then obviously now in the age of social media, new media, <laughs> um, you can always perform, put stuff online, see right. if people like it and watch it and, and maybe get some revenue that way as well. So right. now we're not as limited as we were in the past. I think new media right. has given a lot of people more opportunities to showcase their talent and right. not have to wait for someone to put up a show before they can sing. So that's good. That's true. That's true. Okay, so I'd like to ask you about how COVID affected your music. Mm. You know, mm. we were all struck by the, you know, the pandemic. Mm. And your music, um, for most singers, our uh, profession thrives on, you know, performing to an audience. And all that was cut short. What did that do for you personally? You know, it affected people like me, the way it affected everybody, exactly. you know. Um, and first and foremost, safety first, right? Yes. We want to make sure everyone is safe. Healthy. Unfortunately, COVID did hit us quite hard. People lost their lives. So 
it's expected that, look, for events that would bring a lot of people together in one space, we would have to kind of hold off on them for some time. Yeah. So, yes, it obviously did affect me, other singers as well, other performers, events organizers, the whole kind of event and entertainment value chain took a hit from that. Um, it was also, you know, I actually had COVID. You had at the COVID at the yourself. very beginning of the year, right. literally January first, twenty twenty one. Bam, lost my sense of smell. I'm like, oh, cool. oh, that's a bad sign. Oh my! Went and got the test done. COVID. Um, right. So had that's to recover from that. that. You know, it's, it's just so <laughs> twenty twenty one has been a year. You know, but um, yeah. it, it's it, it also gave me time to reflect and yeah. and just realize that look. You just have to, first of all, be thankful for life, of course. be thankful for good health, stay healthy, because without that, you really can't do anything. That's true. Once you're healthy, everyone's all right, then you can start to think about getting back out and singing and performing again. But in the yeah. meantime, why not work on a project? So, you know, we're trying to work on some musical projects. Okay. Yeah, quietly. And then when that's ready, we'll come out with it. So Amazing. I think that, yeah, the time gave a lot of people the chance to reflect, yes. you know, sit back, take a, take a, a look at, you know, your life, <laughs> reevaluate some things. <laughs> and the things, things that matter most, the right? The things that matter most. Right. And a lot, I think a lot of creatives took advantage of the time, yeah. the lockdown and some of the restrictions to work on, on other projects. And so if you, if you want to say maybe that was a blessing out of the COVID yep. thing, then perhaps that was it. Yes, that was a it. A great yeah. blessing in disguise. We didn't mm. know. We didn't know. know. It's, yes. the, it's it's been <laughs> terrible as well, though. You yes. know. But um, we have to take take the good where we can. Exactly. You know. So exactly. I'm excited to hear that you have some projects upcoming. Yes. Do you have anything for us vocalists, for us singers? Anything? Um, for singing, you know, okay, I do teach voice, actually. Okay, now, before COVID, I was teaching. <laughs> okay. COVID stopped that, obviously, right. because of, you know, not being able to get in proximity with people and all right. of that, being safe. Right. Um, now, my problem is finding time to teach. Right. And I have students who are waiting. Aww. I have students who want lessons. I don't have time to teach them. Oh. So, um, my next course of action will probably be to try and put something virtual together, right. which isn't the same. I know in-person instruction is great. It's always the best, but at least just to give people some, some pointers and tips that they can still hold on to and hang on to. Because honestly, just to, to find a stretch of time where I can give enough individual lessons is pretty difficult because I have a pretty full, full schedule. Um, yeah. But and there's also the possibility of doing a voice class eventually where yes. I can work with people at the same time in yes. person, yes. not just virtually. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But I always feel bad when people call and they say they want lessons or my daughter wants lessons. I want to take lessons. Oh. And I'm like, time, time, time. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, un it's unfortunate, but... I will try. I will try to make time. Yes, to we'll find hold a way. you up. We'll hold you up for that <laughs> promise. And yeah. we'll be looking out, you know, for, for anything of the sort. I personally will be happy to join your class. <laughs> and so many cool. of us would be happy to as well. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so at this point, cool. we'll take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Thank you so much for staying with us. We are back here with Kokri Salome. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Thank you again for having me, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank right. you. So we gather, a little bird told us that you had a massive project with South African legend, Yuma Sekela. Now, how, how was that? How was that feeling? And what did you learn from that experience? It was a Christmas album you did with Huma Sakela. Yes. How was it? And what did you learn from it? Um, it was surreal. I, I actually still can't believe it actually happened. It, it, it seems like something that happened in a dream. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about like, mm -hmm. oh, because when I think of it, I'm like, did that really happen? Like, that was Huma Sakela, you know? Like, the great Huma Sakela, yeah. may he rest in peace. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest things I learned from that experience was no matter how, what's the word? No matter what legendary status you acquire, achieve, right? Yeah. It takes nothing away from you to show kindness to an up and comer or someone who isn't known because that's what he did for me. Right. He was so gracious, so kind, so accommodating, so generous 
like he he just gave his artistry to the project oh. and i didn't even i mean there was a, a point where i had recorded my vocals and i went into the studio the next time and he had been there the whole night wow. recording his flugelhorn part wow. so when i got in he had done everything he had listened to all the songs all the vocals i had laid and he just played and i thought who does who what superstar <laughs> legend does what? that for right. someone he does, he just met, doesn't know. And it was all thanks to a very nice couple, Irene and Edward Akufuado, who have been friends with him for years, decades, probably. And he, he was visiting them. They introduced him to me. And he said, sure, I'm going to work, I'll work with her. <laughs> you know, that, I think that's quite rare. And I will always respect and admire him for that, for giving me that part of him, his artistry for that project, which... I'll, you know, I'll always be able to hold on to that and cherish that. And it, I, I understand that it's a very unique and special thing yeah. that I experienced. And I, I don't take it for granted at all. Trust me. The funny thing about it is that he, he had no idea about the songs. Uh -oh. He must have had no idea about Christmas. Like he was uh -oh. literally like, what songs are these? <laughs> I mean, these are Christmas songs that you and I both know. Yes. Right. Nothing. He was like, okay, I'm, uh, this is totally new to me, but fine. But he's still... Was it, I mean, he played as if it was <laughs> second nature. I mean, we know he's brilliant. Yeah. But I thought, oh, that's so interesting. And so he saw it as something new that he could try mm -hmm. because it was, it was a different genre challenge for him. Yeah. And I thought, wow, even at his age with all of the experience, he still sees a new challenge. Like yes. he's played everywhere. I mean, he's yeah. accomplished everything. And he was able to still find joy in doing this thing with me. Yeah. Charlie. <laughs> that's that's an experience I can never ever take for granted. And I really thank God for that that whole experience and for his life. And may he rest in peace. Amen. I'm yeah. grateful that there are still people like that who can, yeah. you know, descend below all the power and the fame and everything yeah. and still come back to baseline oh, he was humanity. So down to We're all just humans. We're all just so human. That's, that's lovely. I wish I were in your shoes and I experienced that. Listen, but the good thing, thankfully, my hair is natural. Right. He Masakela would not he will not take a picture with you. He will not shake if your hair is like, <laughs> permed or if you have like a weave. Are you serious? Or, he he will not. He's all about natural hair. So he actually looked at my hair and said, Is that is that your hair? Is that natural? <laughs> and you know, I had locks. So and at that time my locks were even long. Like I had and he I, I was like, Thank God this is my natural hair. Otherwise this man would not work with me. Seriously. Right. Or maybe he would have said I would have to change mm -hmm, my hair mm -hmm. to work with me. And he was very strict about that. I remember we wow. went for an interview, I think it was actually a city, yeah. And we, we we went there and that afterward we were taking pictures and there was somebody in the picture who had a weave and he said no she she should leave the picture he would not allow her to be in the picture because of her hair oh wow he was re in that regard he did <laughs> not play like he was like no your natural african hair that's our hair that's beautiful right that's what we should have i mean you've got to respect it i i was yeah. i was blown away by him that's he was amazing. such a, you know, such a star, such a legend. Yeah. Wow. Good for you. Yeah. That is a good experience to have. Definitely a yeah. wonderful experience to have. Now, away from that, quickly, I just want to know what fond memories you have of music school. Uh, you know, what do you remember from your time in music school? So many things. <laughs> um... I remember because my undergraduate was at liberal arts. My bachelor, my bachelor's degree is in theater and music and right. drama. Right. Um, and that was so. Even though I was a music major, voice concentration, you still have you know your liberal arts courses to do. Then you've got your theater major and drama major courses. Music. So, it, but graduate school at New England Conservatory, that was intense because that now it's like. Everything is about music. Everything is about music. It's about singing. It's about your voice. It's about performance. It's about, I mean, we did everything. We even took, we took makeup classes. We took dance, well, movement classes, they used to call it. Wow. Because let's say you're performing in an opera, I don't know, one of these romantic operas, and there's a scene where the chorus has to dance or something. Then you've got to know a few steps. Yes. Whether it's a waltz or a minuet or something. So you did then all that. We had to do those movement classes. Wow. So don't ask me if I remember the steps. <laughs> I could probably remember a waltz, but we had to do, yeah, makeup classes. They, they, they taught us about highlighting and contouring your face. So they, they taught us, like, if you need to make your nose thin, right. they showed us how to do that. Right. If you need to make your eyes wider or smaller, they taught us how to do that with makeup. Oh, if you need to make yourself look older, right. they taught us how to do that. If you need to give yourself wrinkles, all of that. And the, the reason was that, look, if you're in a show, 
and you don't have enough makeup artists to see to you. Exactly. You've got to be able to do it on your own. Yeah. And most of the time, unless you're maybe the prima donna or, you know, the star, <laughs> you probably might not have yeah. a makeup artist. So you, you have to be able to do that on your own. Right. Um, and, you know, my teacher, my main teacher in graduate school, her name was Helen Hodam. And when I got to NEC, I think Miss Hodam was, in fact, nobody really knew her age. We all guessed she was 90 something. <laughs> very, very old lady. Um, and when I auditioned, I remember seeing her sitting there. Now, Miss Hodam was the voice teacher of a, a famous opera singer called Denise Graves. And Denise Graves is a mezzo soprano. Yeah. At the time, she was one of like the younger, really popular opera singers. And we loved her. Some of I mean, people like me because she's black. Right. And she had accomplished so much singing at the Metropolitan Opera. She was famous for playing the role of Carmen. Right. Now, Helen Hodam was... Denise Graves' teacher when she was at New England Conservatory. Okay. So I was so excited to work with her because I thought, wow, this is the woman who taught Denise Graves. Mm -hmm. You know, and she's this old lady and she taught me this little voice. But in your lessons, boy, I mean, she would sit there, she'll hear something wrong and she'll just turn her head. She was, she was always hunched over like this. She'll turn her head looking like, no, no, my dear, don't sing like that. And she would play and then she would sing. I'm like, this 90 something year old woman, if you hear the sound she produced, <laughs> you know, uh, but she was such a darling. I mean, she supported me a lot in so many different ways. Um, I, I'll always, always be grateful to her for the way she helped me. And then, you know, friends, friends that I made along the way, the experience was interesting. Um, again, it's very competitive because everybody's there to specialize, yep. you know, in just, their instrument and music, or maybe they want to teach, so doctoral, but it's a very intense, the conservatory experience is a very intense one, very competitive, um, but it's a good place to be if that's what you want to focus on. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Cool. And I am sure that anybody who goes to music school can battle any Ghanaian makeup artist. <laughs> <laughs> then you come out and you'll be perfect. You can do the contour and everything I'm on your own. I'm telling you. <laughs> right. They have a, they'll have a run for their money very soon when we all go to music schools. Yeah. All right. So now finally, before you go, I want to ask you a very sensitive question. And it's mm. about um, female singers. Generally, female singers and pregnancy and childbirth. So many of the singers I know are worried mm -hmm. about the effects that pregnancy and childbirth may have on their voices. I want to find out if you, because you've had, you know, maybe a number of experiences with mm -hmm. pregnancy and childbirth, of course, <laughs> if you can tell us, you know, how yours was and then what we can do, expectant mothers, um, young singers aspiring to, you know, go into music full time or whatsoever, what we can do when we do get to that stage. First of all, how your experience was. Okay. Um, well, I have four children. Right. And I had all of them through cesarean section, actually. Okay. So I can speak from that perspective. Right. Uh, someone who had all their kids by natural birth may have other things to share. But okay. for me, I actually I sang with all my pregnancies. Right. Um, in fact, when I recorded the album with Uncle Hugh, I was pregnant. Okay. So, um, but I'll say everybody is different. Exactly. And literally everybody is different. And even every pregnancy can be different. True. I mean, there are people who have their first pregnancy, no issues, second pregnancy, maybe something. So <laughs> even on, on that scale, the same person can have a different experience with each child. Exactly. Um, so it's difficult to say or to give like a one size fits all kind of response. But what I would say is listen to your body. Right. Um, if something doesn't feel right and you know something isn't right, talk to your obstetrician, gynecologist. But if you feel healthy, if you feel like you're okay, you know, physically, um, there are little things like when you're pregnant, obviously there, there are times when, especially toward the end, you get a bit heavier. Yeah. You're fuller. You're carrying a heavy load there. So it's... You, you'll get more fatigued. Right. You may find it a bit harder to breathe deeply okay. because of, just because there's a baby that yeah. you're, you know, so, <laughs> and that baby is taking up a lot of room. So it's going to start pushing up your diaphragm. Okay. And you're, so it'll be diff difficult maybe to take very deep breaths. But there are people who sing, I mean, I, I sang, I sang well into, I mean, like, well, third trimester. Wow. So, it's, but maybe it also comes with a bit of expertise. So, again, it, you have to know your body. You have to know what you're capable of. You have to know if you're comfortable still 
sustaining your breath while you're singing if you're pregnant and then maybe at which stage of pregnancy if you're somebody who gets a lot of morning sickness and you can't even get out of bed obviously that might affect you singing yes for me luckily i didn't have morning sickness all that stuff so i was okay i could still work and all of that right. um but other women are different you yes. know some people throw up every day throughout the whole pregnancy yes. i mean True. pregnancy is another thing on its own <laughs> so i guess my experience was pretty good because I was able to keep singing okay. and keep working and, and all of that. And at the time where I felt it's a bit too much for me, I stopped. Um, with this, my last born, I remember I was asked to sing at a funeral out of Accra. Right. And I declined because there's no way I was going to be traveling yeah. like eight or almost nine months, like almost, <laughs> and they were like, oh, exactly. I should, you know, they really wanted me to do this thing. And I said, listen, if it was in Accra, I might do it because right. I'm very close. Right. But the fact that I won't even be in Accra, I don't want to risk it because, exactly. you know, health services, all you just don't want. And then you'd be on some bumpy road. Next thing you know, yes. trouble, you know. <laughs> so in that regard, I said, no, no, no. It's, it, I think it would be a bit too much. Um, so you, you just have to know yourself, know your body. But there's absolutely no reason why if everything is okay, you, you can't or shouldn't sing, sing when you're pregnant. No. Yeah. It, it's, if you can do it, sing sing happily i think it even maybe helps the baby oh yeah like the baby yeah my kids like singing oh, <laughs> and, yes. they and got they, then they sing in tune which is good oh yeah good for you so <laughs> maybe you know they heard things when they were in the womb and that has helped them yes yeah i think especially my firstborn the one who i was carrying when i was recording the album he can pick up a song like that oh. when he hears it on the radio or he can i'm like how do you pick that up so quickly Maybe he, I don't know. Maybe he was inspired by Uncle Hugh. I don't know. But yeah, if you can sing, sing. But again, always listen to your body. Talk to your doctor. Don't overdo it, you know. But why not? If you're pregnant, don't worry. And if, after you have children, again, yeah. same thing. Everyone's different. For me, I was able to still sing. Right. Did I notice some changes in my voice? Um, Not particularly, but it takes a while just to get your ab muscles to behave again okay just a not but you know just have to kind of get back into breathe yeah. support breathe support but no nothing major nothing major yeah. so we can do it definitely oh yeah yeah you can definitely. do it well thank you so much for sharing that i have personally learned a lot great and because everybody's different i hope that my experience with pregnancy and singing would be as good and as yes. positive as yours i'm sure it will be i'm sure it <laughs> right. will be yeah, thank yeah, you yeah. so so much for sharing that you're welcome and thank you so much for coming on the show thank you for having thank me you. But thank you all so much for watching and I hope you have enjoyed this episode. Please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow our social media pages. Now before we leave, Kokri will leave us with a parting song and I hope that I will see you here next time. Once again, my name is Michela Jagri and this was Life of a Singer. Say